think all of you can I think all of you can hear me well. So, SIF, uh, uh, I work in SIF. This is a, a global private equity in impact investment company uh, based in Washington, D.C. And uh, you see it is operating like for more than 30 years. So here in Bangladesh, uh, we are working since uh, 2010. And uh, we do most of the impact investments here as foreign direct investment. So in this region, uh, I think we have several investment in other countries as well, like in India, in Vietnam, uh, in, in Indonesia, Philippines, many other countries. So the core focus of our company is to, uh, you know, invest in SMEs or medium enterprises. Those have miserable impacts. And we also have some, uh, you know, interest on, on the climate issues, because as you know, the climate change is a big issue. Uh, and uh, the world is suffering a lot. So realizing that, uh, SIF introduced several funds in Bangladesh and uh, uh, we are managing it uh, since 2010. So my role is mostly managing the private uh, in, you know, equity investments in, in the companies in the form of equity investment. So here uh, we invested in many sectors. If I name a few like, uh, it would be like agriculture, agri-processing, then uh, IT-related companies, renewables. Uh, renewable energy is a big sector we look at. And also some other uh, service and other sectors as well. So we are mostly sector agnostic. So regarding, regarding the, uh, since uh, I'm discussing about the brief of SIP and this focus in, particularly in Bangladesh, so uh, we have seen many opportunities across many sectors and companies in Bangladesh. And as you know, we have passed a tough and difficult situation due to COVID. And uh, hopefully this is uh, slowing down uh, in many parts of the world. But uh, our part, we are still struggling to, you know, facing the increasing number of cases. So hopefully it will uh, slow down gradually. But the uh, good thing uh, I can say that uh, the SMEs or the entrepreneurs are the real fighters. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you compare the recent, some of the recent statistics or issues of Bangladesh with any other regional countries, you will be, I think, astonished uh, with the comparison. Like well, some of the countries uh, have suffered, suffered negative growth or, you know, degrowth. But uh, in case of Bangladesh during COVID, we, we have seen like more than 5% growth. And uh, Asian Development Bank, they, you know, termed this is the highest growth in South Asia. Not only that, in the next year, uh, both Asian Development Bank, many DFIs, and also the Bangladesh government projects that our growth would be more than 7%. So which, what sectors actually are driving the, the growth of this country? So if I just name a few briefly uh, in the beginning of the introduction, these will be like uh, the manufacturing sectors. So manufacturing and industrial sectors are the key driver of our economy because as I have say, said that these entrepreneurs are very hardworking. And even in the COVID situation, they you know, moved around the country and uh, looked for opportunities what they can do. So these hard entrepreneurs actually are the drivers of our country. And uh, if you, you may also know that uh, many of the countries in this region are suffering like uh, lower lower foreign reserve, then uh, the external front is under very severe pressure. But uh, in Bangladesh, we have seen that our foreign reserve is uh, one of the historical highest now, now at present, more than $37 billion. And both remittance and you know export have started to pick up very slowly. So definitely this will grow because as COVID situation is slowing down, these things will definitely improve. So as I was mentioning, some of the sectors may be, uh, you know, consumer sector is very promising here. We have seen then IT related sectors. It may be health technology, it may be education tech. Even in, for Bangladesh, agriculture is a big sector. Agri-tech agri may be a big sector. Then we have seen artificial intelligence and data processing sector. That is another thing uh, growing slowly, but it will, uh, you know, reach to a good stage at a few years later. Then again, we have seen like, uh, you know, e-commerce sector, that is a huge uh, growth we have seen over the last few years. And uh, other, other, if I name few other sectors, that would be like outsourcing sector. 
so, so for, for like you know india is a giant beside us but uh, we have some competitive strategic advantage with which are ahead uh, which can be you know uh, you know our competitive advantage compared to india so that, that that's outsourcing market is more than 200 billion dollar maybe but definitely that's another so these are the very brief of the some of the sectors and opportunities i'm looking for now but if i name few challenges that would be you know raising capital access to capital for the smes or startups and and also some of the in, uh, internal uh, financial system issues like um, npl non performing loan and liquidity so these are time being uh, and hopefully this will be over very soon so that, that's just a brief of my uh, organization, my what I'm doing here and what opportunities and challenges I look. Thanks. Definitely, yeah, that was that was great. There was a lot of interesting interesting content in there that I'd want to revisit later. I'm especially interested in uh, what you said about AI and also learning more about how Bangladesh has done so well uh, during COVID compared to other countries. Um, but uh, you mentioned e-commerce, which is interesting. I think it, that is a good transition to Yesier, who um, has in one of the, the most successful companies uh, in that sector. And I'd be interested to hear more from him about uh, growing a startup in, in Bangladesh and what it's like to uh, be leading in a new industry like that. Um, hello. Um, uh, thank you, Nicholas, for the opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for participating here. Uh, so I'm Yasser Hassan. I'm currently the head of business development in Daraz, Bangladesh. Uh, so when uh, we launched in 2014, 15, uh, with two or three people and one delivery bicycle, the whole idea of taking e-commerce into Bangladesh market, uh, was, uh, I would say a crazy ambition because at that point of time, most of the meetings that we had with, uh, sellers and customers, even if with the delivery man who used to serve with us was like, what is e-commerce and what is how it's supposed to be? Uh, compared to the, as Noor already, already mentioned, the, the, our neighbor in India at that point of time, uh, there was a big fight going on between Snapdeal and Flip, Flipkart, uh, which actually came in to become one of the biggest business cases in the world. Uh, in the following years, we have grown, we have invested, we have focused on uh, customer experience as well as getting our partners on board. We have looked into the logistical problems that is actually stopping uh, retailers and sellers to be participating in e-commerce and also taking their product into uh, the overall Bangladesh's retail market. Uh, in 2018 May, uh, after a successful acquisition of Alibaba Group, we are now part of the Alibaba ecosystem, uh, which actually helped us uh, with a huge amount of technology uh, experience uh, from different uh, regions of the world, as well as a financial stability. So currently, uh, we are uh, still by far the biggest uh, online marketplace in Bangladesh. Uh, and what I do on, a, on, on my monthly or a daily basis is I engage with uh, both internal and external stakeholders uh, and also run uh, projects and programs and initiatives for the growth of the business, which actually spans from the operational side of the business to a simple call center initiative. Uh, in my experience of e-commerce or what I have faced so far is if you look at the retail market of Bangladesh, it's around about 250 billion US dollars uh, compared to the size of our nation and the number of people that we have is one of the highest density in the world. Uh, the number is staggeringly huge and um, still a large portion of that retail market is still being operated on offline. Uh, what we are trying to achieve is we are trying to achieve uh, small, big entrepreneurs or enterprises to be part of the e-commerce journey in Bangladesh. We have seen recently a huge uh, increase in mobile financial service, Bikash and Nogot, some of the biggest mobile financial services in the country, as far as I know, and the region. Uh, we have seen a lot of people uh, tapping into the 4G and 3G technology and thanks to initiatives from uh, the telcos the internet rate and the cheap handset have given us accessibility. So, and also another thing we have to take into accountability is uh, the average age, if you look at the population size, a huge number of uh, the population is below 30. So, which means they are, uh, what we call it is born in the digital era. So they have, uh, where we adopted into the Facebook culture, we have adopted into the digital culture, they are born in it. So they have gone through that experience. In the COVID-19 scenario, we have seen the result. So uh, before the COVID-19, people, you know, go to the market buying uh, stuff and coming to e-commerce to buy uh, the pricey stuff, the standardized item, that's an iPhone. 
uh, but during the COVID time in the last four or five months, we have seen people participating uh, as a seller because their shops are closed. So they wanted to be part of the e-commerce journey. Uh, we have seen uh, customers who have purchased with us for the first time. And it started with a small grocery item, which led to purchase of a phone. Uh, we have seen uh, freelance riders in Bangladesh, ride sharing companies who doesn't have any job at this point of time and became our delivery rider. So uh, I would say since 2017, this year, maybe due to COVID-19, maybe due to the other aspect, this has been a very good year for e-commerce. Uh, but this is all the potential side and opportunity size. But if you look at the challenges of this market, uh, is uh, this is pretty, I, I would say, out of all the markets I have heard about, Bangladesh is one of the, the most price sensitive consumer base uh, of the world. And also, if you talk from the perspective of third party support like logistics, technical side, uh, we are yet to uh, become a big powerhouse. So I think uh, uh, the large young population is tapping into the whole digital ecosystem. We are seeing a lot of startups coming in, a lot of uh, new business ideas coming in as well as we're seeing adapting them to the digital finance and digital shopping experience. Um, so I believe uh, Bangladesh could be one of the best or the biggest market in the region, uh, definitely after our neighbors uh, in terms of digital uh, financing and digital market and digital economy. So Amazing, great. Uh, and so why don't uh, we move on to Eric, who can tell us a bit more about Telco, which seems to be facilitating Yasir's business pretty well. Yeah, hi guys, I'm uh, Eric Os, I'm the CEO of Obanolink. Um, I've been um, in telecoms in Asia for around 20 years. I, ca I came to Asia around uh, 20, in near 2000. And uh, <clears throat> since then, I've been uh, having jobs in uh, in several countries: Malaysia, um, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and now back to Bangladesh again. Um, I, uh, when I got involved with Bangladesh, it was in uh, 2001 with Graminfo. At that time, I, I became a board member, and uh, somewhere into that um, assignment, we celebrated one million customers for Graminfo. I think they have just recently passed 70 million. So, uh, but um, so I've been involved in in the country since then with with the break, um, uh, which also gives me an opportunity to observe a couple of different political regimes, uh, which has happened over over these two decades, and uh, and that's been quite useful. I can get back to that. Um, I um, I came to. Uh, to Grameen Phone after serving the board for a couple of years. I also served as a CEO. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, although that's many years ago, I think it still illustrates many other things with the country, um, which is the, the growth opportunity and, and the massive growth you can create in a country like this. When I was in Grameen Phone in 2004 to seven, we grew the customer base from 2 million uh, as a CEO, uh, we grew it from 2 million to 15 million customers in three years. And, and that, that, that's big in, in, uh, even in telecom. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think this whole growth thing is, is an important element. Um, and I, uh, I came back to Bangladesh in 2015, then as a CEO uh, of uh, Barnalink, which is uh, a totally different assignment. Barnalink is, uh, is smaller than Raminfo. Um, we are number three in the market uh, and a challenger. And on top of that, uh, when I joined in, in 2015, we were facing quite significant um, turnaround uh, challenges in the company. So uh, we, we had to, to change the organization quite significantly. Um, so, so that was a little bit of a different approach than what we did in Grameen Fund some years earlier. Um, Recent development for those who are not in the country is, of course, uh, 4G is important. We, we launched 4G only two and a half years ago, so that was quite late uh, compared to the rest of the world. Um, we are involved in that. We are also involved in uh, various types of value-added content over and above the telecom services, video streaming. Uh, we are trying to get into mobile financial services, but that's uh, highly regulated and, and, and there is a priority to, to banks. 
and also into e-commerce. Uh, so I have many other things uh, deals with, with uh, other speakers. Um, I see, uh, generally speaking, talking about uh, business in Bangladesh um, is first of all a growth economy. It grows fast in uh, in uh, in GDP and in, in the economy. Uh, and I think there are there are many aspects of this. Uh, of course, you have many people, uh, which means doing business doesn't mean you need to address the whole nation. You can, you can pick pockets and, and, and focus on certain either segments or regions. Um, young population was mentioned. 50% of the population is below 25 years old, uh, which gives a massive opportunity if you are into at least new technologies or new ways of doing things and digitization and everything. Um, I am also observing um, a um, improved basic education level in the country. The literacy rate is going up quite significantly, at least if I compare to my service in the country 15 years ago and now. So literacy is going up. I also feel that infrastructure is improving. Uh, be it uh, basic infrastructure like uh, like roads and, and so on and so forth, also into electricity. Again, you can say none of this is definitely not Singapore standards, but uh, but it's it's it, it's improving and developing. Um, and I see uh, an increased digitization across many many different dimensions. Again, admittedly, it's, it's not a digital nation as such, but maybe instead of seeing kind of a government driving digitization, you will see this young population and, and these huge crowds driving it themselves. So it's kind of maybe another driving force than what you see in, the, in some other markets. I, I think there is one more uh, element that I, I appreciate the Bangladesh, and, and that's the people. The people, the attitude um, that you can create. It's not easy. It, it's not easy to, to produce things in Bangladesh. It's not easy to, to get things done. But if you find the right people and you put together and create a winning team, there is literally, and I've been working in many countries, but in Bangladesh, when you, you know, get to put, put together the right team, you can literally go and move a mountain. And, and that's a uh, that, that's something that I, I found very special, and is maybe one of the reasons why I, I really love working with uh, with Bangladeshis in uh, and in Bangladesh. Um, so 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 and, and there are a lot of people with high education in Bangladesh. Of course, you know if you look at the ratios and so on, maybe you don't see that, but there are a lot of very well educated people in Bangladesh with very high standards, also very high ethical standards. Uh, but, but you need to know what to do to, to put together a company like that. But that, that's my experience. Um, of course, in telecom is is a infrastructure also, and we we are of course um, uh, highly regulated. Uh, that's normal for telecom. Um, on to so regulations is one thing, but I, I think one of the the more uh, negative factors, if you like, or at least factors to keep an eye on. Uh, at least in our industry, is unpredictable tax, is taxes and regulations. You, you got to know uh, what type of policy is being run in the country. Telecom is special. I don't know if I need to go into that, but it's a little bit unpredictable. And sometimes you get a feeling that there are short-term regulations and short-term initiatives taken to, to, to bring in uh, money to the government exchequer. And that, that gives you a, a, some uh, unpredictability. And shareholders, they don't like unpredictable situations. Um, there's also probably for foreign investors a, a currency risk. I must say I'm, uh, I'm pleased and satisfied with the relative stability of the currency. But I think Bangladesh will always be identified as, as a country with, with certain currency risk, given that it's emerging uh, economy. Um, and there are the liquidity in the capital market is limited. Whether you go for a, a, a listing on the stock exchange or whether you go for, for loans in, uh, in banks, if you are in, in larger investments, uh, there are sometimes some liquidity issues. 
Last comment, uh, Niklas, if you wanted to spend one minute on, on how we see the COVID-19 situation in the country. Um, that started basically uh, in, uh, in the second half of March. In our company, we took all employees into a, to a home office environment, except for those who are in the field. Um, that went very well uh, as such. Um, but of course, um, uh, there are many questions related to this. Uh, I feel that uh, being in a digital industry, uh, we, we can continue operating. We are relatively popular. We have a dip in performance, in uh, especially in April and May, but we see business coming back now. Uh, so, so that was more of a, a dip and we are, we are getting back into a roughly zero growth in the year 2020 compared to 19, which is 5% less than where we should have been, but it, it's still, you know, it's not a crisis for the industry. Um, we have also seen that, of course, a part of the COVID situation is that a lot of people are coming back from other countries, especially those who have been uh, the expatriates that have been working in oil-rich countries. So they're coming back and instead of feeding their families, they need to be feeded. So, so that leads, plus a lot of people are unemployed in the country right now. So they, they, there is a humanitarian crisis one way or another. Um, so, so we, we so that's uh, one aspect, there are lots of people without work. Um, and we also see many people shifting, uh, when they lose their jobs, they shift from cities to rural areas. So, so there's been a population shift where they move into back to villages, but that's, it's gradually coming back. Um, generally speaking, I, I still, you know, there is a crisis, uh, an additional crisis because of COVID-19, but I think also Bangladesh as a country, um, is the type of nation that will come back. So I, I, for us, long term, we don't really look at COVID-19 as a, as a change or investment strategy or anything like that. It's a, it's dip, it's a dip in the economy. So all in all, uh, lots of opportunities and, uh, and, uh, and a great uh, country and uh, uh, place to be, to be honest. Thanks, Niklas. Great, amazing, thanks. And I'll have uh, Sajid go last, and then after that, we'll open it up to questions. Hi, Nicholas. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I almost feel like because how rosy every everyone is, uh, everyone's uh, perception and projection of Bangladesh prospects uh, have turned out to be. I should just play devil's advocate, but no, I mean. Jokes aside, I mean, of course, I'm very bullish about Bangladesh. It's difficult not to be if you do a lot of work here. Uh, but I'll just start with my background and, as you said, lead into how this ties in with understanding or identifying you know, investment prospects in Bangladesh. So I grew up in Bangladesh, but I spent most of my life, uh, my early life, working in the U.S., uh, U.K., and India. I am a career investment banker turned academic, so my first job was at Morgan Stanley in New York. So I have worked in the investment landscape there. And then when I was in, in, in India, uh, I was working with KPMG Advisory. And that was at the time of the global financial crisis when a lot of the work that uh, American and European KPMG partners were doing was being offshore to India. Uh, so I was overseeing that transition, which is similar to what's happening now, because a lot of the challenges we, we faced during the global financial crisis in 2007 have analogies with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a lot of the trends we see happening now because of the pandemic. Um, since I moved back to Bangladesh in 2011, my first stint was I was overseeing foreign investor, foreign investments at this local growth bridge company called BRAC EPL, which at that time was handling about 80% of all foreign investments in the stock market, in capital markets. So we have worked very closely with Grameen Phone. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, my team uh, did a bunch of uh, non-deal roadshows for Grameen Phone to get foreign portfolio investment into their in, into the Grameen Phone equity. Uh, this was in 2012, um, and uh, so ever since my capital markets days, I have now what I do now is I basically work as an academic and researcher and a consultant, and I also have my own NGO. Um, in terms of academia, I'm an associate professor at ULab. Uh, I oversee a research center there and the executive MBA program there. In terms of consulting, I work with a number of international fintech companies, including Tala. Tala is a Silicon Valley based fintech company, and I'm advising the market entry into Bangladesh. So I am familiar with the sort of challenges digital uh, invest or digital businesses face in Bangladesh. 
And beyond that, I'm still in touch with the Capital Markets Board and I do a bunch of advisory work with different investors and foreign uh, players wanting to enter the market across sectors, every sector agnostic. Um, so what I see, both from the pers perspective of an investment practitioner and a researcher slash academic, is um, I think it's, 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 it's cash money too, right? Because Bangladesh is a story that hasn't been told enough in some ways, but in many ways it has uh, recently been told a lot, but I, I think in some ways, not in the best possible ways, right? Uh, so we know of the garment sector miracle that has happened in Bangladesh, of course. It's, it's a small country, but now we have the second largest sort of uh, uh, export basket uh, for China. China is, of course, the first by quite a distance. Uh, there's threats to the situation because there are other competitors like Vietnam who has fared better because of COVID. There's Ethiopia that's growing, there's Pakistan and a few other countries. But I think the threats at the start of COVID were more severe. Uh, it's interesting how garments entrepreneurs really buckled up as COVID hit them. And despite a lot of controversies and criticism that we got into about how they restarted factories very soon and perhaps not often with the, with the right guidance. I was in a television talk show talking about this once and I got uh, criticized for speaking on, on, in beha on behalf of garments industrialists and entrepreneurs. But the fact remains, um, I mean, there are of course valid criticisms to be made about how quickly things opened up or, or how uh, the lack of planning with which certain things were happening things that happen but i think overall what's important to point out is uh, the sector is resilient so i do echo eric's uh, sentiment that there's a certain resilient quality about i think the Bangladeshi nation about the people uh, it's a bit of a cliche people talk about it and you know what what does res res resilience really mean but i mean COVID has also borne that out uh, i think the way in which the sector has bounced back is very interesting um the other sectors for example that are interesting right that are perhaps uh, more developed in a certain other countries, but are still tugging, like, chugging along at a fair pace. Um, say, if you look at uh, the consumer sector, right? The consumer sector uh, is grow is huge, is growing. E-commerce is growing. Uh, we have Daraz here, which is the largest e-commerce platform in Bangladesh. Uh, but that said, I'm sure Daraz would love to get into the real business now that's happening at the F-commerce level. A lot of the economy, a lot of the uh, online transactions are still happening to Facebook, as Yasser I'm sure knows. There's a recent article on this that was very interesting. This uh, article actually said, uh, Bangladesh is what an economy would look like if Mark Zuckerberg ran it. Um, because everything from, let's say, a puppy to a parrot to uh, you know a mobile phone cover, I mean, people usually go on Facebook and start searching. Um, so it is a very large population that's online. Bangladesh has the benefits of a demographic dividend. Uh, people uh, have access to the internet, so digital technologies are waiting to take off. We have been sort of at the cusp of the takeoff for a long time. I don't think we're there yet, especially if you compare our sort of ecosystem with, let's say, India's. And I don't mean to compare telcos. Telcos have done well, but I do think telcos are an exception because telcos have gotten foreign investments like no other sector has yet. Uh, the largest players are multinationals. They are uh, they contribute significantly to the foreign direct investment of the country. They have created massive employment, have led to the growth of other sectors of, like advertising and, and other creative agencies. So I have a lot of respect for the telco sector in Bangladesh. And, uh, but that aside, if you look at the other sorts of digital uh, uh, sectors or the potential sectors that are ripe for digital interventions, uh, we have, let's say, uh, the mobile wallet space, the mobile banking space, Bplash is definitely a behemoth, a giant, and it's doing extremely well and has great prospects. Uh, I'm an investment brag bank, and because from my time uh, in, in my uh, from my brokerage days, I mean, so we, we did valuations way back then about Pikash and where the mobile money market is was headed, and it, and a lot of things we foresaw is coming true. So mobile wallets and mobile money and mobile banking is going to be huge. We're now seeing movements along the lines of digital credit. It's been slow. Countries like Kenya and even India have been more quicker. Uh, our financial regulators tend to be conservative, and perhaps rightly so. But COVID has, to some extent, accelerated uh, their uh, sort of adventurous mindsets, adventurous impulses. And now we have seen licenses for now a bank in Bangladesh, Citibank, is going to do uh, a, a sort of digital credit based on alternative rating, credit rating mechanisms with Bcash. That sort of field, fintech, I think is ripe for growth. Uh, there will be more investments. I'm a part of several fintech associations and forums, and we are doing a few pilots where we're trying to understand um, exactly how much, how investable are fintech startups in Bangladesh. Uh, ride sharing is an interesting space. Uh, transportation is a sector that has had severe problems in Bangladesh. Um, 
because public buses are from, you know, uh, are, are very archaic and they are, are often have very poor hygienic conditions. And let's just say they're not the best modes of transport for everyone. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nightmare getting on a public bus in Bangladesh and going from one place to another. I don't know if Nicholas ever attempted to do this in Bangladesh. Uh, but public transportation has severe limitations. So ride sharing took off, right? Uh, Uber came into the market because of COVID, Uber's food, uh, on-demand food delivery service has withdrawn. Uh, but ride-sharing is poised to grow. Uh, we did projections before COVID that suggested that ride-sharing would grow about 10 times in the next seven years. Um, there are other sectors that are poised to grow. Uh, on-demand food delivery is poised to grow. Restaurants were a huge business in Bangladesh. Uh, people often joke that because it's a conservative Muslim country, uh, people don't get to have a lot of recreational outlets. So what do people do? People go and eat out. And we've, we've seen a lot of restaurants mushroom in Bangladesh. I've lived and worked in India, and just without any research, in terms of my own anecdotes and impressions, I've seen restaurants in Bangladesh that I think can live, uh, can, you know, can sort of compete with the best restaurants in India or Myanmar or other countries that are perhaps more, uh, that, get, that get more foreign investments or that have more expats. Um, so that was a great sector that have taken a hit because of COVID, but on-demand on food delivery, I think will do very well. There's a major player in Bangladesh called Food Panda, and they're sort of leading the way. Uh, they have raised recent rounds of investments. Uh, there are other local players like Batao and Shahos who are also forced to do well if they can survive COVID. Uh, beyond that, I think if, if we are talking about health, uh, sorry, investment prospects, I think we have to talk about health. Health is a hugely underinvested sector uh, in Bangladesh, as you know. Uh, whatever numbers you look at, whether it's hospitals, number of hospitals you know, per capita, uh, per capita number of beds per capita, um, that's the sort of uh, uh, sector that I think is ripe for foreign in investments and interventions. Uh, we recently saw a major, major investment and buyout when one of the leading private sector hospitals, Apollo, was acquired by, I think, the Evercare Group, or they became the majority owner. That was a huge deal. I don't have the number on me, but I can look it up. But I do think, um, so I mean, a lot of these numbers are hush hush, right? But it was a massive deal. Um, so that's another thing about Bangladesh. These numbers are often very difficult to get by. So as a researcher, of course, something, that's something I struggle with. But to continue talking about uh, health, I think digital health is poised for growth. There is one player that is, uh, has a strong tech stack, so to speak. Uh, it's called uh, Digital Health Services. They used to be called Telenor Health Services. Um, they're a major player. Other uh, platforms are now offering digital health as well, telehealth as well. But you still have a shortage of manpower, a shortage of skilled human resources, so to speak, right? Uh, I was recently having a chat with uh, an investor who has invested in a mental health startup because uh, his whole thesis was that mental health is, can be another sector that can do well in Bangladesh. Uh, and there's so, such little business or services in this space. So he has invested in a mental health startup. And um, so I was just basically speaking to him about potential opportunities. And uh, so opportunities are abundant. And when you have a population that's large, right? Because Bangladesh has uh, the seventh largest population in the world, living in a country the size of the state of Michigan. I mean, uh, that demographic reality itself positions you for a lot of, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, different kinds of interventions. That you know, so that those are the sort of things we're seeing play out. But I think what needs to be said, though, is um, there are challenges, right, to Bangladesh. There's challenges to, for instance, those of you here who have had experience in recruiting. I'm sure all of you have had experience in recruiting. Uh, recruit, recruit, rec recruitment is not easy in Bangladesh. I think uh, we do need to invest in things like skilling, uh, in things like uh, upskilling of the human resources in Bangladesh. We have a lot of universities in Bangladesh, but that doesn't mean everyone gets to go to one. But that doesn't mean that uh, 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 most people graduate from good universities. And even uh, a lot of so-called good universities have, uh, I mean, uh, there's a tremendous scope for improvement in terms of whatever curriculum they're offering and how uh, job market ready their graduates are. We hear from employers that there's a big disjunct between what the corporate environment or the public sector environment or the NGO environment wants and how ready uh, university graduates are. There's that. Uh, there's also a dearth of research funding in universities and research in general as a culture is not as large in Bangladesh, Bangladesh as it can be, I think. Uh, in terms of employment numbers and employment rates, we do sometimes see scary statistics. Uh, even before COVID, we had statistics that suggested that I think less than 30% or 40% of university graduates actually get employed. So this demographic dividend has thorns that come with it, uh, has challenges that come with it. And we're yet to crack, I mean, how to sort of generate massive scale environment, uh, employment. 
Uh, investment growth is steady. It's around 16%, I think, but it, of course, can do better. Uh, it can do far better. Uh, we need a deepening of the financial ecosystem in Bangladesh. Uh, until now, most of the investment is generated by banks. And that is obviously not the right formula because you need capital markets to deepen. Um, what happens with banks is um, uh, banks have high interest rates in Bangladesh, or used to at least until COVID struck, but now things are sort of up in the air because there's now the ceiling on banks, but they can't charge beyond 9%. Uh, so the six nine percent uh, ceiling that have been capped six percent for deposits and nine percent for loans now what traditionally happened was bank financing was expensive right and you could only get bank financing for three to four years or five years but for often time let's say if you're on apple and you want to come up with an iphone you need a bond right you need a bond for 10 years uh, what happens in bangladesh we don't have a very developed bond market we just uh, when i used to work in the markets which was about seven eight years ago the number of bonds that existed then and the number of bonds that exist now, not much have changed. If you look at the number of initial public offerings, IPOs, uh, not many companies are encouraged to enter the public market to uh, be uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so there's that. So I think there's a lot we can do. Uh, uh, if you want to understand why this happens, there are, of course, uh, very typical frontier market issues in Bangladesh as well, uh, with local companies at least, their corporate governance issues which is one of the reasons why a lot of companies don't want to sort of, uh, you know, bear the scrutiny of entering the public markets. Uh, I recall in 2011, I had a coverage universe of 21 stocks, 21 equities that I used to cover and I used to sort of give information to foreign investors so that they could read these stock reports or investment reports and invest in the stock market. If I had to do this coverage now, I would probably add two more stocks. So we haven't had a lot of good IPOs, but we have good, good companies. So when you don't have good IPOs, you don't have a depth of the financing that's available to your corporates. And when you don't have that, you don't have a lot of investment growth. And when you, when you don't have investment growth, you, you're not going to have jobs. Um, I think the government has done well. The government has uh, invested a lot in infrastructure over the last several years, which has led to this sort of very tangible impact on GDP. Uh, uh, but beyond that, I do think the sector, uh, uh, the country, country requires a deepening of the financial ecosystem. And I do think over the next two, three years, we'll see some of that. I think COVID has woken a lot of us up. And I think what you'll see is a lot of investments in the digital business ecosystem as well. And I hope in FinTech as well and digital health and, and, and other sort of sectors. So that's uh, all I have right now. Thank you. Great, yeah. I think there's a lot to respond to. And I, I think it would be interesting to hear uh, some of the other participants' thoughts on uh, what Sajid just said, because um, I know a lot of what you said is related to what Neural does, and um, yes, here I'd be also interested to hear more about your thoughts, uh, since you're someone who has launched a very successful startup in, in Bangladesh and have been part of its growth. Um, I think uh, one question that's most related to uh, what you were discussing is uh, what opportunities that all of you see for um, digital growth or startups in Bangladesh, a lot of NCF students right now um, may not be taking this traditional path due to COVID, and so we may have time on our hands uh, when we graduate. Rather than being uh, management consultants, we may be looking for other opportunities. So um, I'd be curious to know, you know what the rest of you see as um, areas where there could be opportunities for, uh, for growth in Bangladesh. I know that Sajid was very um, bullish on fintech and digital health and a few other areas, but I'd be curious to know what uh, the other participants think. All right, uh, can I jump in? Sure. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, so definitely Sajid Bhai and also Eric and Yasir Bhai uh, pointed a lot of interesting sectors and opportunities in Bangladesh. Uh, as I have mentioned earlier, a few of the sectors uh, actually will be the growth leader in the coming days. Uh, we have already RMG, that's a big sector. But some of the sectors uh, that I think uh, would be very interesting in, in future. So as I, I was saying that like, as uh, Sajid Bhai said that one of the big problems for Bangladesh is unemployment and what uh, the currently the rate is even in the post COVID situation. So one of the things we have seen uh, that how the outsourcing market, at least call center on the voice and non-voice segment, the business process outsourcing market, the evolution in this region. So if you if you see uh, like uh, the employment generation, the uh, business process outsourcing industry, the sector is uh, creating, 
this is a huge impact and uh, definitely government has some programs some trainings that uh, that is conducting through, through several modes and that is helping not only uh, the uh, urban people but also in some remote or rural areas they are training some of the even female and women uh, you know trainees are over there so uh, the thing is uh, we have one competitive advantage that's called you know the uh, you can say the uh, salary uh, rationalized salary or uh, labor cost and also the quick adoption of technology so as i was mentioning that like uh, this is a huge market like india is more than 200 billion dollar market so 200 dollar dollar billion dollar market is, is a is a large size and if you compare that with bangladesh this is only less than a billion dollar or so so what we expect that uh, you know since we have a large talent pool in bangladesh and we have uh, the ecosystem is growing gradually so some of the order some of the outsourcing market definitely bangladesh will catch up very soon and as you can see the development in philippine the development in vietnam uh, i can say same development is happening in bangladesh and one of the key areas of development that uh, that uh, we actually did have done in the past several years that is digitization so for by that i mean that uh, you know if, uh, if uh, I, uh, let me clarify a, a bit detail so so that you can understand a bit more uh, like if you think about the you know uh, the form processing or any data processing from outside countries like us or from europe so it will take some sort of technology to process that and bangladeshi companies are already have that technology they are deploying it and uh, you can say artificial intelligence or data processing data uh, analyzing technologies these issues are already uh, bangladeshi companies are applying so the thing is the main uh, thing uh, will be the main competition will be on on the on the price on the quality quality of the service then on timing and uh, obviously on the, on the networking like how uh, we approach and communicate with the global players so uh, definitely i am very much bullish on the outsourcing market and and then uh, again uh, since agriculture is a very basic sector i cannot ignore agriculture at all for, from bangladesh so there uh, most of the sectors actually we have uh, discussed here already so i am discussing the sectors that is left already not discussed thoroughly so like from agri processing you know fish is a fish is a big market in bangladesh and and the taste and and texture of bangladeshi fish fish is uh, i think good I so if, yes yeah <laughs> many many of the people already know that so uh, the key thing is how bangladesh bangladeshi companies actually are processing this fish and uh, most important thing how the companies are processing the waste so a management of waste or if you think about the waste uh, water treatment plant or effluent treatment plant these issues are bangladeshi companies doing very well nowadays so the thing is we are ready for export and we are currently we are exporting like uh, half a billion dollar 500 million dollar maybe but my projection is that uh, since we are fish abundant and technology and you know processing everything is there so it will be a big sector moving ahead and the health technology or education technology these sectors are covered already uh, i i am very much bullish on data processing as well as i have mentioned so uh, there there are many companies who are working on how to process the data and uh, these companies are big uh, companies and also good certified companies like cmmi level 5 or or uh, like this kind of a standard so 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 that's uh, pretty brief about what i think some of the bullish sectors uh, or potential sectors we can look ahead thank you nick can i chip in one comment sure um because we spoke about uh, education in the country and so on there's one more thing gender diversity you have access to highly educated women. It's not easy to, to, to keep them uh, active in the, in, the, in the companies. I've seen that myself, and we are definitely not a benchmark in telecom. 
but you really have access to educated, uh, highly educated women. I believe it's more than 50% of women uh, graduating from universities. And, and uh, I have very good experience uh, with, with the those we have managed to keep. And uh, there is an opportunity. You, you've got to put everything around this so, so it works. So it's possible to continue working when you have family and all of that. But uh, I, I just see it as an opportunity. For sure. I agree. I definitely agree. Right. Uh, the, yes, uh, that, that would lead me to my next question, unless Yasir has anything else to, to add about this. Uh, so, uh, um, regarding opportunities in Bangladesh, so I would divide the entire thing into two. One is the domestic one, and one what Bangladesh can do on international market. So, if you look at the export, uh, last year, as far as my data goes, we did uh, 18, 19 fiscal year. It was $41 billion of total export for Bangladesh. Uh, the nearest competition within the region is Pakistan by $24 billion. And if you look at a large portion came from RNG, uh, leather, uh, and also came from egg grant fisheries. So uh, RNG market is already pretty saturated, but the still is growing. Uh, this is a very challenging place where uh, I, I think, but still I think Sajid Bhai and others can give some more insights on that. Uh, but if you look at the agro market uh, as a whole, uh, fisheries, as mentioned by Nulbhai, is it's gonna it's doing very good. Another thing is the leather. So uh, processed and uh, 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 the final products. This is where we can do pretty well. We have some giant companies from Bangladesh who are actually exporting. Uh, we do not have a brand yet from Bangladesh. Yes, made in Bangladesh brand doing very good in the global market, but there can be a very good potential about it. This is on the international side from export from Bangladesh. On the domestic side, uh, if uh, uh, just to just to share a little bit of story. So as Sajid Bhai was mentioning, so the transportation industry. So when actually Parthao launched, um, uh, giving the opportunities, you know, you can ride someone else's bike to go to a certain destination. It was a pretty new concept in Bangladesh. And when Uber came in and, you know, the whole thing was there. And the reason behind it is it solved the problem. The problem of the transportation that on a daily basis we faced. Uh, the public transportation is uh, needs a lot of development. Uh, the affordability of car is still a little bit far-fetched. So if we look into the whole uh, domestic situation, there are a lot of sectors we can work on. Uh, we can definitely uh, work around same taking the agro market and making the entire logistical solution and giving it to the uh, consumers with a lesser and better quality of price. Uh, so I think, I think uh, from uh, if you look at Bangladesh and the economy and how we do our stuff, so if you look at the opportunities, we have to take consideration there is a large domestic market of 160 to 80 million in a very small place, uh, which is actually developing day by day. And also uh, the opportunities where we can actually serve external uh, clients outside the country. Uh, I mean, through our, as uh, Nulva mentioned, through our data processing, the software developments, maybe through goods, maybe through uh, creating brands from Bangladesh in a global market. Yeah, and just to quickly jump on this, uh, Nic Nicholas, um, you talked about how INSEAD students graduating and how, what could be relevant for someone uh, who's not thinking of joining a McKinsey now, but perhaps uh, using the Singaporean network and INSEAD's wonderful network, uh, maybe do something that's related to Bangladesh. I think, so, you know, these are the sort of things that I also ask myself, right? I mean, how do I network with an INSEAD, for, for instance, or an INSEAD alumni, which is one of the reasons I was interested in this webinar. Uh, because some of my work with my NGO does take me to Southeast Asia, and the Southeast Asia is exciting, right? The whole belt between Japan and Bangladesh. There's a lot happening, a lot of growth happening, a lot of growth to be had in the next 40, 50 years. I think that's where most of the growth is going to happen, the global growth. Um, so I think in terms of, so there's a lot I think in, that can happen in, ter in terms of knowledge transfer. Um, so in terms of, so there's a lot I think possible both in the, in the education sector um, we hear that there are, there are so we expect investments happening in the private university space. A lot of Malaysian universities are currently going to be setting up shops soon. And even some Aussie universities or Australian universities through Malaysian channels, um, because um, it's a large market. I mean, people are going and, you know, university education is something parents invest in. I mean, back in my father's generation, when they paid nothing to get a good degree from University of Taka, to now where people are paying quite a bit and you know middle class families and even lower middle class families are paying quite a bit 
to get a private sector, private university education. So it is an interesting market. I mean, South Asian culture does dictate, as Asian cultures do, I'm sure, as you know, that education is deemed very important and critical when people save up. So that's an interesting space. So I think there is going to be that opportunity also on the ed tech front, because as uh, interesting as education is, the fact is most people of the university going age are not going to universities. Uh, if my data serves me right, I think around 35% of people in the university going age actually attend universities. So there are a lot who don't. Uh, so there is that ed tech angle, I think that's at play, especially if you can partner with universities because people do like investing in degrees as opposed to just a course. Uh, which is one of, the, one of the things that edtech startups struggle with in Bangladesh because they're all trying to create the Coursera of Bangladesh, right? Assuming that people will just download and consume content. But people here do have a mindset of chasing certificates, especially students. Uh, so there's that. I think beyond that, uh, 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 in Singapore, I think there's a lot to learn, I think, also in terms of uh, you know some of the sectors that I mentioned, whether it's fintech or health tech or retail tech uh, and, and the gamut. So I think in the realm of digital businesses, there's a lot I think that uh, an INSEAD network can bring to the Bangladeshi startup ecosystem. So if that's ever a conversation you want to have, I'm sure all these gentlemen here can help you as, as can I. Uh, see if uh, there is, um, of course, Bangladesh, uh, they're behemoths and they have a lot of access to the startup ecosystem. So that's, I think that could be an interesting entry point for any INSEAD uh, graduate wanting some frontier mar market experience. Definitely. Um, so I, I, I want to open this up to the audience too. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to write them in the chat or just raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on you. Uh, but uh, before that, I, I think another interesting question that came up was that uh, I think all four of you have mentioned the uh, demographic dividend and the talent pool in Bangladesh. And um, I mean, and Sujit has just been talking about some of the difficulties uh, that are there as well. So. Um, let's say we are, you know, NCS students who want to come either, you know, do entrepreneurship in Bangladesh or invest in companies in Bangladesh. Uh, how would you, uh, I guess it's a very broad question, but how best would you engage with the talent pool there and what best practices have you found in terms of going your businesses uh, in Bangladesh and uh, working with the people there? I'll go last since I just spoke. All right, I'll just jump in. Um, so basically, um, in, so there are these ecosystem builders in Bangladesh, right? Uh, in the startup ecosystem. Uh, and there are people you know, and of course some of these gentlemen here are among them. Uh, and so I think a good uh, point of entry would be to sort of connect with them. And uh, because, and there's also this Bangladesh Angel Investor Network, BAN. It's run by this very enterprising gentleman called Nitro Rahman. He was, he, he grew up in Texas, he now lives here. Uh, he does a very good job of uh, connecting, um, you know, sort of high potential startups with local angel investors. So he usually has like a big pipeline of investable companies. Uh, there's other individuals. So we are actually also running this pre-seed uh, pre, uh, stage, well, idea stage startup accelerator from California. It's called the Founder Institute. So we're running it in Bangladesh with uh, a few partners. Um, so if you want to get introduced to some of these people who I would call ecosystem builders, I mean, that could be an interesting way to get into conversations about so what's out there, what can I invest in, what's early stage that I can sort of, you know, get in on at the bottom floor level and help build up, uh, or what are some really advanced stage startups where I can perhaps advise and connect with uh, investors in Singapore. So I think there could be all sorts of relationships depending on, you know, the, that sort of thing. But of course, I'm only talking about startups right now because... Uh, I do follow a lot of the things that are happening with the, with the NCAD sort of uh, ecosystem in, in startups, and I think there's a lot that I think we can learn from what's happening in Singapore. Uh, yeah, thanks, Eric. Absolutely. And as Sajid mentioned, uh, definitely. Uh, so, um, in my opinion, uh, there are a lot of stakeholders in the uh, investment or startup arena, starting from NGOs Network, then uh, Venture Capital and Private Equity Association as well that's well run by some of the organizations. Then uh, there are uh, certain startups in Bangladesh, group of startups. So in my opinion, all the stakeholders as a whole, they are open. And uh, 
if you reach out to any um, you know uh, group like even in bangladesh angels network or private equity venture capital association or even any particular uh, venture capital or private equity organization they will definitely uh, you know cooperate with you and 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 uh, i do agree with what eric said that uh, the good way could, could be you know do some kind of good research uh, what you want to do because it is uh, more important to understand what actually you are uh, targeting to do and what is your objective. So if that is clear and, and you have certain amount of data, uh, uh, data points in hand uh, and you can do the, some kind of research so that you can easily understand that what, what you should do the next. So on, on the uh, friendship ground or on the you know, networking ground, Bangladesh is very you know, accessible, any, any kind of uh, stakeholder groups. And uh, if you, uh, I, I'm not, I don't know if you know about uh, the startup deals or, uh, you know, private equity deals, these are already available in website. If you go to some of the research or website like, like Lightcastle Partners, databd.co, they list all the past several deals, what happened in Bangladesh. So if you look at those deals, what deals are happened in Bangladesh, at what price, at what valuation, and who invested in that, those deals, you will get clear understanding what is happening in Bangladesh. So my suggestion would be to do some kind of basic research uh, before you know um, engaging with any stakeholder, and I think that would be very really helpful. So if you need any data point, I, I'm sure Sajid Bhai is over there, and I myself can help as well as well. So we are all the stakeholders, starting from Bangladesh Angels Network, BC Association, um, all are open to help or support. Great, uh, but yes, here I'd be interested to know uh, more about uh, your your job as head of business development. Uh, you talked about how you basically have brought an industry that was completely offline online, and I was wondering uh, what the strategies that you've used to do that are, and how you'd suggest other people who are trying to bring you know the huge Bangladesh market online and turn it digital. Um, okay. Uh, so my experience of bringing offline to online or our experience of bringing offline to online was based on one single thing. It's how we interact and the relationships that we have. Uh, one thing is that uh, when we started the Dara's journey, I came in a little bit, bit uh, later on. Uh, none of us were e-commerce, any prior experience to e-commerce. So when we came in, I joined in from British American Tobacco as a officer. I came in uh, with FMCG and I joined it. I had a few colleagues with me. They came from B2B sales background. Some of them uh, came from uh, hardcore advertising background and came in. And when we started on, we started talking with people a lot as uh, how, how this uh, e-commerce can bring good portion to your business how this can be very good for you you know getting your product at a house at the baseline proposition of e-commerce and then we got to know about the problems as well because we got to know that they're gonna if i say it's over in bangladesh i'll be i'll be lying uh, directly so it's still there a little bit uh, we got to know about uh, how a retail owner a small manufacturer wants to go into the national market but he cannot uh, reach uh, someone in another division or another district due to his lack of access to better marketing tools, uh, lack of access like that. And we took those learning and we tried to implement it in the, in the rocket era. And we were doing it in a very uh, small budget and uh, small resources allocation. And then, and as far as our journey goes, and we interacted with a lot of partners. So we got into uh, partnering up with the different, different uh, uh, people from different industries. Or so let's say uh, we went on to meet with the leather industry experts is, you know, you, you want to bring some of your product in uh, in our market or why don't you take a little bit of uh, product from the small sellers to or your showrooms. Uh, we talked with uh, software solutions for the partners so that they can operate it in a better way. So in, in our uh, course of just, we learned it ourselves and we try to maintain relationship with different, different peoples. And uh, one of the key things that we faced in the earlier days, which is still a little bit there, 
that is the government because uh, at that point of time e-commerce was pretty new the whole concept was pretty new so we still don't have any experience uh, a lot of thing happened and i'm not a political analyst as well but uh, the government agenda of driving digital have helped so now we are more you know um, uh, meeting with secretaries more meeting with ministers here and there and uh, we talk about policy we talk about how uh, uh, digital The business should be in the business books of universities and stuff like that. Uh, so then the third part came when Alibaba, all the things that we were missing, all the things that we were talking and we were needing, that came in all of a sudden. On one one fine morning, we open our laptops and we get the systems that we. And then we invested heavily in our logistics and network. Uh, so we are still doing. Uh, so recently, we announced that we. We'll be investing on about 500 crore BDT uh, in span of next two three years, only on logistical facility because this is one of the big. So our relationship with uh, brands, the big brands, came in handy after all these years. So we can support them with a bigger business. Uh, so which also brings it brings the point as well. If anyone of, from the participant pool or anyone from uh, the network wants access uh, to Bangladesh's business or Bangladesh's economy. I'm not as good as uh, Sajid Bhai or uh, um, uh, yeah, no Bhai, Rul Bhai, but uh, I can, uh, I'll, I'll try my best to hook you up with the right people. And also I do agree with Eric's uh, proposition is, you know, you have to hire someone. And when you hire someone, you also give them the, the training and the right resource. Uh, if you do that, I believe we can do that. And we have seen a lot of people who uh, started from small uh, e-commerce. There is also people came from ride sharing and delivery units uh, came out from MFS as well, who actually started the journey the same way we did. Uh, came with no learn from the basics, uh, did the job, and we eventually learned a little bit. I'm not going to say we are all experts in our domain, but we learned a little bit. Uh, so those people, since we participate in the journey together, and most of us graduated in the similar uh, uh, year or back and forth, so we are still in touch. So if the network wants a little bit of help to know about uh, industry experts, I can contact one a few of them. Excellent. So I feel like this could keep going for a long time. I, this has been really fascinating uh, from each of you. I'll open it up to the audience in case anyone else has questions. And um, if anyone wants to make a parting statement, that would be great as well. But I don't have anything else to ask. Well, I guess the, the audience doesn't have any questions, uh, but yeah, it was, it was great speaking with all of you. I'll send you the recording after this and um, would love to keep in touch because this was a fascinating conversation. I would love to learn more from each of you about what you do and your experience in Bangladesh. Well, thanks for the initiative, Nicholas. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. It's a great pleasure and I think uh, it's an honor to join and share our views here. And any kind of support uh, you need in future, uh, I'm open to help. Sure, thanks so much. Thank you, uh, thanks a lot, Nicholas, for the invite. So, Sajj Bhai, uh, Noor Bhai, Eric, thank you for being in the panel and sharing your opinion over here. It's been a great learning. Uh, so, hope to meet again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mumbai, Yastrakai, Eric. It's great meeting all of you. And thank you to that friend. We're off to help, of course, Dan. So we shall see you in the future. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Bye.